I want to begin this morning, and I'm going to read you, and I say uh, I want to attribute uh, this opening to Tara Shasky, who is an open justice multimedia journalist for The Herald, and has written a piece over the weekend which I believe is like the story we had last week of the burglar or the uh, or robber thief, the thief who got caught in a citizen's arrest and the police said let him go in Christchurch. This story is perhaps even more shocking um, and because it is so important, I'm simply going to read it to you. So this is from the Herald over the weekend from Tara Shusky. A middle-aged man with a mental illness took his daily walk to McDonald's where the staff knew to expect him and which combo he would order. But while waiting for his meal inside the family restaurant, he was stabbed and brutally beaten, all because of the red jersey he was wearing. Up to 13 Black Power members and associates took part in the attack at the Harbour of McDonald's in South Taranaki on September the 12th last year, as staff and diners watched on in horror. While some of the men remain un unidentified, eight were arrested and charged for the sustained beating and on Friday, seven were sentenced in the New Plymouth District Court. The sentencing drew a heavy gang presence to the courthouse, as well as police and due to the numbers of offenders, the hearings took place over three sittings throughout the day. Each hearing saw the public gallery at capacity with supporters who threw up their clenched fists and yelled the gang slogan, Yoza, in tribute to their comrades as they were taken away by correction staff to begin their sentences. Judge Tony Gregg opened each hearing by offering a chance for karakia, which was taken up by one matua at the second sitting who spoke from the gallery. The judge then advised that he and the court would treat the offenders and their supporters with respect and he expected the same in return. As each man was sentenced, reports of childhood deprivation and trauma, intergenerational gang ties and loyalty to the brotherhood were heard, as were the full-time jobs the men held down, the Fano they were devoted to and the remorse they felt for what the judge described as mindless violence. The level of involvement in the, attack, in the attack varied between the men and some were jailed while the rest were given home detention. What was mostly consistent were the bumper discounts applied to the sentences. Um, and look, I could go on, but you will just lose your stuff. You will lose your stuff. Uh, I do, can I just thoroughly recommend you read the story in its entirety, but you get the picture. You get the picture, and I think New Zealand has got the picture for a while. The story is associated with a photograph outside the court of these morons in their black power Taranaki um, jackets, shaking, holding their fists up, wearing blue. And I think it's a bloody sad story played out time and time again in New Zealand. Um, but... Uh, Let's talk to someone who might be able to do something about it. Um, Shane Jones, uh, New Zealand First candidate, and as we said on this program, law and order is a big issue. Uh, and this story, uh, I think, well, Shane, what do you think of this story, this tale of our wonderful justice system and society? You there, Shane? Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah, Sean here. What do you think of this story, Shane? Oh, look, it's an indictment not only on the uh, behaviour of those individuals, those criminal cockroaches, but what on earth is the judge doing? A court is in session when the judge and reposed in the judge is the law the order, the authority, and indeed the mother of our entire justice system. What on earth was the judge doing and the police enabling these people to come to arguably 
what is at the centre of an ordered society and carry on in that fascist, in that ugly, in that wretched, wicked way. What the hell is happening in Taranaki? Is that judge afraid of the families that these cockroaches belong to? I was not only disgusted, but I was deeply saddened. You know, if you and I went to court, I or my children or my mokopunas or my neighbours, we would be absolutely shit scared that we were going to either go to jail, our reputations, or indeed our livelihoods would be imperiled. These people rocked up as if they were down at some hoedown and decided to treat both the law and the court as something that they're in control of, that they rule over. I absolutely detest what I saw in the media. Yeah, and Judge Tony Gregg gives them the chance, though, of a karakia before their hearings. Is that appropriate? Well, why were the police so ill-prepared? Why were the court staff so ill-prepared? Now, I know we've got to be careful because a judge at the end of the day is in charge of dispensing uh, not only justice, but he's got the ability to deprive you and I of our liberty. And uh, both, uh, both of us have had experiences with uh, the judicial system. To me, it's, it's not really about the karakia. To me, it's about the fact that they were able, number one, to arrive in their intimidating, ugly colours, but more importantly, they were able to just to rock up to court and treat it as if they were down at some party. They were down at some pub that they'd taken over and they were basically urinating, figuratively speaking, over the rest of us. Because if you don't rely on the law and if you can't trust the law to be the basis of ordering our society, what the hell have we got as a society? Nothing other than naked, ugly, wretched, Black power, intimidation. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. Gangs seem to be quite acceptable, despite the fact that the Prime Minister says, oh, the Labour's got no tolerance for them. They have given them millions in drug rehab funding. Harry Tam, a former gang leader, I think mongrel mob, I'm not sure which, I don't really care. Harry Tam gets hundreds of thousands of dollars for writing... I know reports about how all these people have had tough upbringings, which is why they're thugs. And we see over the weekend, Shane, that basically uh, I think the mongrel mob down in Christchurch had a Labour candidate um, attend one of their meetings and they basically declared themselves as wanting to ensure that Labour stays the government. I, I'm not entirely sure if I've ever met Harry Tab or indeed um, O'Reilly, I know. Mm. O'Reilly's brother, I think, was a human rights commissioner yep, back in right. the 90s. Yep. Um, and look, good on these guys if they're trying to bring these cockroaches, these parasites, into the world of light. But know this from me. If we do not move with the strength and the severity that the Aussies or indeed the Israelis move. I don't think I don't think we can rely purely on the Aussies for a model as to how to stamp out this this uh, cancer. I think we've got to borrow from the Israelis. Now the Israelis live in a part of the world where they're surrounded by genuine terrorists, by genuine killers. These people, yes, they do kill, they are thugs, and they have um, the brains of a grasshopper's private parts. However, the difficulty I see is that it's going from one generation to another. There's between eight to 10,000 of um, these individuals on a, on a police gang list, apparently. This notion that they have access to universal entitlements, they have access to universal rights, I would strip them of their rights in a nanosecond if it enabled us to teach and force them to accept, you have no rights in the absence of refusing to embrace 
duties and obligations. Why the hell should the community and the rest of us live either in fear or live in trepidation that they might look at us one day, they might attack us one day? Mm. Uh, New Zealand, sadly, our liberal traditions, our love of freedom, our love of uh, enjoying the traditions and the rights that we've taken for granted are being not only trounced, they're being absolutely abused by the very existence of these groups. I hate it, mate, and I'm thoroughly behind what Winston has been saying. Mm. We'll give them one chance to come into the world of light, and after that we'll borrow and approach championed by the Israelis of getting rid of this cancer. All right. You would be broadly then in support of the tougher policies being advocated by the National Party as well in relation to law and order. Now, the National Party have simply been magpies and they've nicked what Winston and I have been saying for the last several years. I doubt, however, that the National Party will be able to deliver. Uh, I've got a great deal of... Um, respect, and I genuinely do appreciate the stance taken by Mark Mitchell when he was a cop, he's worked overseas, and I think he does have the strength. However, I'm not confident that the other uh, National Party senior MPs will follow through with this business. You know, let's, let, let's be honest here. The victims of the black power are their own people. The victims of... See, I, I'm often criticised for taking a very staunch approach, and they say, oh, well, Shane, you're just victimising these Māori whānau who themselves are victims of many years of abuse and trauma. No, the main victims of their cancerous lifestyle are my own people, Māori. And it's almost as if the, the citizenship of the victims is irrelevant, and the focus of the media and the focus of those who either dispense justice or hand out welfare or employ these people, is that we only focus on the blighted and benighted circumstances of these individuals. And it's, it's almost as if the, the victims don't matter. Well, what's the point of citizenship? What's the value of your citizenship if you've got these crypto-fascists running around, growing generation after generation, basically destroying what it means to be a Kiwi. Mm. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think many people have reacted exactly the same way to this story uh, out of Harawa, uh, uh, Shane. Look, while I've got you here, uh, I, I, we're also this morning looking at the issue of Kerry Allen. Do you know Kerry Allen? And, and what do you make of the rumours surrounding her or the controversy surrounding her? I... First met Kitty when she was in a relationship with Mika Faitiri. She's a, a, a jaunty, uh, very um, assertive young woman, obviously not without ability. But I have to say, over the last few years, she seems to have gone through some sort of metamorphosis. And perhaps it's down to the fact that the Māori caucus under Jacinda's leadership grew in their assertiveness their numbers have expanded, and the rest of the Labour Party seems incapable of teaching them that no one in politics is greater than the party. No one in politics is greater than the collective strength of the brand that brought you into politics. And I don't know if this is accurate, but Kitty seems to have assumed either because she's recently been ill or because she belongs to the Māori caucus, that she is number one, above her obligations to the Labour brand. Number two, that she is bulletproof. Now, look, I know that Indigenous rights and Native rights have grown under the leadership of um, Jacinda as a key part of their narrative, their ideology from New Zealand. But my, my message to Kitty and the Māori caucus is that look for what binds people together. Why is she so silent as the Justice Minister? Why is she so inconspicuous 
as a senior Maori parliamentarian against the case that you and I have just spoken about in relation to gangs. She had virtually nothing to say challenging the outrage that we saw in the Portiki when the monk mob decided to take over the town. Now we've gone to the other side of the country. The Black Power have done something, in, our, in my view, arguably worse. They've taken over a court. So, look, I can't account for why this native bird has run around picking all the other birds, but it's uh, very, very sad to see, and I believe that it shows the low ebb at which Māori politics has settled. Mm. Well, the government, of course, say no formal complaints, but my understanding is these are quite senior public servants that have concerns. What is the culture like in terms of ministers getting out of line or getting abusive to senior staff? What is the culture of complaint there in your experience? Well, I... I'm no stranger to how frustrated ministers get when civil servants can't deliver what they want. And senior civil servants live in a rarefied atmosphere. There genuinely is a problem in New Zealand with the State Services Commission. It's got a new name now, and I'm sorry, I can't exactly recall what it is, public service something. Um, The leader, Peter Hughes, in my view, needs to hand in his resignation letter. In the pursuit of diversity, in the pursuit of equity, in my view, that man has ruined not only the talent pool, not only the status, but the capacity of the civil service to deliver. Where are the Jazz McKenzie's? Where are the Margaret Baisley's? Where are the Graham Scott's? Those are the Portala trees that I recall in the 1980s and the 1990s, the Dom Huns, who, when the government was restructuring the economy, you could rely on these people. Now, the basic civil servant, she or he, their feet are made of clay. So it's highly likely that all of the ministers get frustrated and are unwilling to give them a free pass. The salaries, the perquisites, the entitlements of senior civil servants are vastly greater than members of parliament. However, if you're a member of parliament or if you're a minister and you're reduced to screaming and shouting and intimidating and bullying, then it's time for you to hang up your spurs, go back to whatever church, whatever job, whatever community role, whatever business you came from and resume your private life. Okay, are you saying Kerry Allen should resign? Well, I can't understand. I, I don't understand why she's uh, even remaining in that job. There is a pattern of not only egregious behaviour, but Kitty is not delivering. Remember, she gave that uh, highly petulant, if not arrogant, display when she promised and demanded that Kiwis accept her view that there would be a new code and there would be a new law um, dealing with. Um, uh, with not only with uh, the media, but we would have hate speech. Yeah, legislation. yeah. Well, she got pulled into yeah, line pretty I, quickly on that, that, didn't she? She was speaking out of turn. No, no. Well, she, well, not, not only was she speaking out of turn, uh, that was a case of the native bird using the wrong orifice. Mm. I hear you. Uh, look, Shane, good to talk to you uh, this morning. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your time. We will talk again soon. Shane Jones, New Zealand First candidate. Well, he's pretty clear about what happened in Taranaki and interested too in his comments on, on Kerry Allen.